We've discovered this far in our wisdom journey that God created all that is, including this Garden of Eden, a beautiful, peaceful paradise. Have you ever wondered why uh, the world we exist in is anything but a beautiful, peaceful paradise? Why didn't we inherit the Garden of Eden from Adam and Eve? Well, the answer is found in Genesis chapter 3. It's one of the most tragic chapters in human history. In verse 1, we read this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now this particular serpent doesn't need any introduction, does he? He just shows up in the garden when Eve is evidently alone. We're told here that he's crafty. The Hebrew word means sly and cunning. My friend, you give him the key to your back door and he will soon own your house and you'll be out on the curb. Now, keep this in mind. This temptation is going to take place when Eve has perfect living conditions, peace with God, a wonderful marriage to Adam, amazing harmony with creation that surrounds her. This is paradise. Listen, nobody who chooses to sin can claim it's because they they lack some kind of advantage, whether it's a nice house or a good education, the right family or a positive environment. They can't argue that if life were easier or better, they wouldn't have chosen to sin. Look at Eve. She has everything going for her, yet she's going to rebel against her loving creator, God. Now, frankly, none of us are any match for Satan. We're never too big to be deceived. That's why the Apostle Paul warns us not to be ignorant of Satan's tempting devices in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. So let's watch here as Satan makes five strategic moves in tempting Eve. Let's be aware of his strategies. First, Satan's going to show up in a form that disarms Eve. He shows up in the garden, possessing a serpent. Verse 1 uses uh, the original word for snake. It's the normal Hebrew word for serpent. Just remember now, before sin entered the world, there was no need to fear animals. The relationship between animals and humans was harmonious, not dangerous. And frankly, Eve doesn't seem to be surprised here by a talking serpent, which implies that before sin entered the world, some animals may have been able to communicate. But Satan is possessing this serpent. He's in control here of the conversation with Eve. Now, secondly, he raises doubt in Eve's mind. It says here in verse 1, Satan said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? In other words, did God really say that this one little tree is off limits? I mean, isn't that a little strange, Eve? What's wrong with one little tree? Did God literally say that? You know, Satan's been casting doubt on God's word ever since. And Eve replies here in verse 2, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. In other words, yes, that's exactly what God said. By the way, it's not recorded for us that God directly told Eve about this tree. We do know that God gave Adam this warning in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 before Eve was even created. This is part of Adam's spiritual leadership, and Eve evidently heard this from Adam. She was evidently a good listener, unlike most husbands, because she basically quotes back to Satan what Adam told her that God had said. Now, there are some who would say that Eve is exaggerating God's command and showed disrespect to his word to Adam by adding that they weren't even allowed to touch the tree. God had not forbidden 
touching the tree, at least in his conversation with Adam sometime earlier. I personally believe Adam added that precaution, not to disrespect God's word, but to keep Eve as safe as possible. Eve, don't eat from it. Don't even get near it. In fact, don't even touch it. He loves her. He doesn't want to lose her, and he certainly doesn't want her to die. Satan's strategy of raising doubt in Eve's mind about God's word doesn't work here. So Satan follows that up with a third strategic move. He now outright denies any danger to Eve. In verse 4, Satan says, you will not surely die. In other words, what do you mean you're going to die? Come on, do you think after all the trouble God went through to create you, he's going to get rid of you? You're, you're not going to die. And if he could, I think the serpent is smiling with a reassuring smile. See, God said back in chapter 2, verse 17, eat from it and you shall surely die. Satan says here in chapter 3 and verse 4, eat of it and you will not surely die. And in case you're wondering, God always tells the truth and Satan never does. He's the father of lies, John 8, 44. But again, here Eve stands her ground. She doesn't reach for the fruit. So Satan takes another strategic step in this temptation, and this one works. He accuses God of being unfair to Eve. In verse 5, Satan says, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. In other words, listen, Eve, God's being selfish. He's not playing fair. He's not as good uh, uh, as he could be to you. He's holding back on you. I mean, how many have listened to that temptation over the centuries? In fact, the tempter might be whispering in your mind these days the same thing. God is keeping something good from you. He's not playing fair with you. He, he should do more for you if he really cared about you. Let me tell you, those are all lies straight out of the Garden of Eden. Well, Satan moves quickly to take his fifth and, and final step in deceiving Eve. He promises her that sin will bring fulfillment. He tells her here in verse 5, You will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, Eve, you're going to be right up there with God, just as wise and discerning as he is. You're going to be able to distinguish between good and evil. You're going to know everything God knows. You'll be independent. You'll be free to think. You'll be free to act on your own. Verse 6 tells us that at this point, Eve evidently stepped forward to take a closer look. The Bible sadly records here, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, this was the physical lure, and that it was a delight to the eyes, this is the emotional lure, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, this was the intellectual lure, she took of its fruit and ate. Did she become like God? No, she became like Satan, who himself had tried to become like God earlier in time. Well, now she turns to her husband, who evidently just showed up, and she becomes the tempter herself. Adam, eat this. In other words, let's be independent of God together. Let's live our lives independent of God together on our own. And the Bible records here in verse 6, she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the sound of them chewing on that fruit has echoed all the way down through human history to this very moment. Let's do what we want to do with our own lives. If it looks good, if it feels good, if it looks satisfying, well, let's eat our fill of sin whenever we want. Let's act independently of God and his word, and let's ignore his warning. Well, what was the result here? Well, Adam and Eve will soon learn They've lost their special communion with God. Uh, they've lost their innocence. Uh, they're even going to lose their unity in marriage. Did they become as wise as God? No. Were they immediately and completely fulfilled? 
No. In fact, now they're empty. They gain nothing by sinning, and neither do we. Because of the impact of this original sin, we will never be able to enjoy what Adam and Eve lost. Not now, not ever, unless something happens. Unless something happens, and something will. And that's, that's next time on our Wisdom Journey. Until then, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.